running over schedule, so stay as long as you can, and if you need to skip out, you know, thank you very much for coming. Well, just tell me to stop. <laughs> well, Graham can go on all day, so it <laughs> <laughs> But I think most people enjoy listening to you, so. Um, before you go, if, if you guys um, didn't get already, we had some packets put together that had some seed information of uh, Union Forge book that kind of gives you guidelines of what the different mixes do, what, you know, which ones are better for certain situations. Um, there's also a Berenberg catalog back there, which is, um, the, there are a few of the seeds that Graham can sell in Canada that we can't currently yet here in the U.S. So um, just can keep that in mind as you're looking three. through the union. You have marijuana? Have <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. been asked no. that before, actually. <laughs> we, can, we can help you out there. <laughs> That's a whole other seminar. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if there's anything you know that you need that you haven't got, grab a seed list. Uh, you have our information. And mostly just thanks for, for coming and, and listening. So and give us a call if there's any questions. Thanks for lunch. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for lunch. Um, just while Teresa was mentioning that, so this Union Forage, um, so in this journey that I was doing here, I started off with nine bags of seed back in 2010. I got it up here for 2011, um, which last year turned out 31 seed cans out of New Zealand. And so Heather and I started Union Forage, and then um, here's the sales pitch. <laughs> um, so then this guy here is an Australian. The next one's a Kiwi. He's a Canadian. Um, Marky works for us. Uh, so I'm just pointing out the first four are owners, and the, and then um, the, the middle two down here are owners, and every one of us is a rancher. So we're actually walking the walk and making the mistakes. Not one of our guys, the Nutrisource here, he does the dairy. Um, he's he is a, a doff of dairy. Not one of the people who work for us directly sit in an office. We're either moving fence, feeding cattle, so on and so on. So. Between the partners in Union Forage, we're over 4,200 head of cattle. Um, actually, that's just about to go up because Darren just bought another 1,000 head. Um, and we're running about 48,000 uh, 48, acres of land between the partners in Union Forage. So we're all making the mistakes and, and then passing that knowledge on to. Hey, that's just a bit of a sideline. <coughs> okay, so this is um, talking about winter tolerancy. So this is Goliath forage rate. You want to, you want to get that back one. So this is um, I seeded it in uh, in the first well middle of, middle of August, okay, in uh, 2015. The seed came late from um, from uh, uh, New Zealand. So I just ran it in Heather's vegetable garden. And then this photo was taken on the 9th and 9th, we got an early snow and, and came really hard. Um, and then this photo here was taken on the 28th and 10th. So you can see how much the Goliath grew in such a short time period. So someone was asking earlier about uh, putting how late we get this in. If you've got a pea crop off uh, or a winter wheat, you can go in here with, with some Italian ryegrass and some rape and really have a good forage stand if we have the moisture or if you're under irrigation. If, you're on a, if you've got irrigation and only using it for a set amount of time through the year, you're totally wasting your investment on the irrigation land. Um, we've got uh, blends that go underneath silage with Italian ryegrass, hairy vetch and, and a forage rape and a forage turnip. Uh, forage turnip is hunter and forage rape is winter and goliath. And so they take the crop off, turn the irrigation back on, and the boys at, <coughs> at uh, um, Springvale Colony are still grazing that uh, two pivots with 500 head of cattle right now. So um, they haven't turned a wheel for your livestock. But anyway, so that's um, the cold tolerancy. Uh, this is, okay, I was talking about that slew that ran through the swath grazing land, that's it right there, but now we farm through it. But this is, this is just showing the regrowth exceptional regrowth but the water was right here okay so I was able to get some moisture and keep on going so this was this photo was taken the end of November well it was about the 20th of November um, but you can see how it plays out up here but right where it was able to get more moisture it was able to really get going 
but um, one thing you'll find with all the brassica family, they don't like wet feet, so they don't bother wasting your money seeding through through that sort of country there. So this is Ben, he's the Kiwi, uh, one of the partners, and he uh, silages and swath grades and does multiple things on his place. Um, and if he gets a hailed out crop or something like that, that's a cereal that he was supposed to harvest, he'll turn into silage. So instead of using machinery to feed it out, he's got the mobile self-feeding silage pit. So a pit can turn up anywhere on his place. He's running 16,000 acres um, of uh, beef cattle. And so um, he's, uh, he's just happened to, a, on 16,000 acres at this north end of the place where this photo was taken, he just took that, uh, sil he took that uh, barley crop off as silage instead of letting it go out to harvest and this made a pit and just control grazing it with electric fencing. So it's just a one way of cutting out the machinery costs. Okay, I'll just run through some, we've done, we've done that. Okay, go. Uh, okay, so this is, I'm gonna go through the advantages and disadvantages of using the cover crops because um, there's, there's just as many disadvantages than there, as there is advantages. So, um, We've talked about the multiple grazing time. We, we can do multiple grazing if you leave some residue and let it go again, leave that solar panel. Otherwise, you kind of it takes too long to get going. Um, we talked about the organic matter. Uh, we just talked about the cold uh, weather, the high digestibility. So that can be an advantage and disadvantage um, with yearlings. And if you're going to range management uh, the yearlings, you're going to need to add straw bales in there to bind them up and slow them down because they'll be wasting a lot of feed value. But with cows and calves, um, we don't see a lot of runny tails. Um, they seem to be able to process the milk, you know, turn into milk quickly, and so they're not using it up as much. One thing with this uh, high digestibility and high energy, and this is very early studies right now, because the feed value is what I was showing you there earlier, so high, Nitrate issues haven't been an issue. So normally with a pregnant cow, you're looking at about 900 parts per million um, on uh, um, 900 parts per million where it gets toxic. Um, we've been pushing up to 1600 parts per million. And that's because it's so high a feed value that it's able to, the biology in there is increasing at such a rate, it's able to eat that nitrate up instead of being absorbed into the blood system. So that's, that's um, it's undergoing studies right now, but we've had some really, seen some really neat things with cover crops. Um, quick growing and easier to start. Um, the hunter is the quickest with the Italian ryegrass. The livestock, uh, some guys say they see hesitations, but on our cattle, they they know it pretty good. Uh, can see in the sod, I'm not big on turning turning land, but if you're going to do this program, you spray in the fall, get your soil tests like Susan talked about, and get um, get the right applications ready to go for the spring. Don't go and spray in the spring, and because you're not going to have a very good kill. Um, so, get a good kill in the fall. The plants take up a lot more nitrates quicker in the fall, and kill better. And then go and get a fertility test, and then apply so that can be done really well. It failed at my place, burnt over at Cherries and Tim Copthorns and did really, really well. And Ben does it a lot straight in the sod too. Um, can handle a wide range of pH, pH um, in the soil. Uh, it depends what you're doing. You know, that two to four should be two to 10 pounds an acre. It depends on the blend you're using. But if you're using a swath grazing crop, you'd use about four pounds an acre and then um, uh, seeding rate with 70 pounds in, but you need FOSS because brassicas like need FOSS, so you should put FOSS in there too. And that's the average price. Okay. Um, as organic matter, uh, water holding capacity, we talked about the 1% um, the holds 45,000 litres, helps improve the biomass of that um, for the. Uh, um, for the uh, water holding capacity. Um, all those roots rotting into the soil does the organic matter. Uh, 
uh, cattle in nutrient cycles. So adding cattle into the into the mix for, for soil health, um, having multi-species. Like sometimes like Gabe and the guys down here, and you might get away with it more, and Jay Fuhrer, and then the guys down in, in the in Oregon in um, um, Oklahoma and that. We found everything that we use up in Canada is about as much as we get in diversity, so about 11 species. Some guys using 26 species in their mix, which it doesn't seem to work up there because our growing season is so short. So it's not having that, we're not, we're putting stuff in there and it's not getting to its full advantage. Sunflowers works really well in Eastern Canada and Eastern Alberta and Saskatchewan, but it doesn't work, work in my area where I'm 40, 200 feet above sea level, so it's a it's a cooler climate. So when you start this journey, just you know go with the basics and add flavor beans or something else in there, and then see how it goes. And then try to think, oh shit, in that blend the um, crimson clover did really well, so I'll add a little more crimson clover. But there's no manuals yet. The government is still catching up to us producers because it's not like we can open a manual and have a look and say, oh, this is what I'm going to do for this area because it's so new that we're all trying to own another thing. Um, we talked about that, putting carbon back in the soil, we talked about that, okay. Disadvantages. Okay, we can get bloat. Um, I haven't struck it, but it, it wasn't bloat, it was black leaf that we did see, so the vaccines need to be kept up. So a whole, um, like I said, I'm not, not organic, but a whole, um, Animal health protocol should be applied as normal, but keep a keep an eye out for things like this. Um, I think the bloat occurred with uh, Mersine clover, crimson clover, and Persian clover in in a blend that was kind of heavy on top heavy of those. Weed control um, is just about non-existent. If you just got rape and cereal, you can use, use Lontrell <coughs> at about 100 grams per acre. I don't know what that means in answers. <laughs> but take my word for it. <laughs> um, like, pick, your, pick your battle, exactly. Pick your battles with the rains. If you've got a low rainfall area, just use the, the don't use the clovers, the Italian ryegrasses. Um, only don't use hunter, forage, turnip, but, and, uh, and some of the bulb turnips, but use the rapes and the, gra and the grazing radishes and the peas, and then you can mix your cereals in with it so you can diversify. Doesn't like the wet soils. Make sure the cattle got a nutrient package. So we use a small company at home, um, Blue, Rock, Blue Rock Minerals, and she, she tests the feed for our perennial stands and our um, annual stands every year. She makes up the mineral what we need for that particular um, pasture they're grazing. So we don't get off the shelf mineral. We find it's cheaper that way too. Um, normally about 10% cheaper than just getting a cargo mineral. Um, uh, oh, so so we talked about the nitrate issues. What I haven't got in there is um, should have uh, uh, anyone got high sulfur in their area in their soil in their water? Okay, yeah. Okay, so brassicas. A very uh, take a lot of sulfur out of the soil and they, and they hog it. Um, if you've got high um, nitrates, uh, high uh, sulfur in your soil, brassicas might not be a thing for you because you'll get polio overnight with them. And polio is swelling in the brain. And you'll see the cattle pushing their heads up against posts and kind of wobbling. The next thing they'll be dead. It happens that quick. So if you've got excessive sulfur in your area, um, you should get a set of soil, uh, soil sample away or a water sample and let one of us know. Uh, don't overseed. Oh, no, flea beetles. No, we talked about that earlier, but you don't need 20, 30 pounds of seed. 10 pounds of the mix and then 10, 20, 30 pounds of a cereal blend. You don't need to overwhelm it. Okay, okay so these are the soil tests I was talking about. So remember that picture I said to the back of the uh, paddock was the round bales. So that's the that's the paddock that has not had livestock on it. And you can see how radical that is. NPKS is all over the map. Okay, and here's the one that's had the cattle on. We've had the cocktails in for you know nine years or so. Um, 
but uh, the cattle have been in there for 15 years and you can see how even that is it PKS is really good, mag cow is really good but the nitrogen is really low so I've talked to a few people that are soil people and my we've done the Heaney tests and um, my biology in the soil hasn't reached critical mass yet where there's enough <coughs> bacteria dying off to replace nitrogen they're eating all that nitrogen as quick as they can to um, to feed themselves and they're taking the carbon in from the fault the, the trash the organic trash but there's not enough dying off to start replacing the the uh, the nitrogen that they're eating but so that's why my fertilizer bill is only 30 bucks 36 bucks so that's something you know you'll probably see that yourself in there we've taken our um, organic matter in in uh, 10 years from uh, 2.8 um, when we didn't do, I wasn't terribly into this as, you know, 15 years ago, but um, we were 2.8 and we're 9.2 organic matter now in our soil. So now we're going to... Hey? Nine. Nine. 9.2. Yeah. Nine. 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 So, um, and you can see that that picture just shows you with the worms in there and all the cottage cheese is exactly what it is. Okay, so we're going to change... Um, um, step a little bit. We we're talking about fencing at um, at lunch there. So this is our permanent fencing here. Our, I call it the feeder lines. And um, so we've got uh, these are fiberglass sucker rods. If you have got them down here, instead of using steel in the oil rigs, they in the wells so they use fiberglass as well. So they you can buy them really cheap. Um, you buy a 30 foot length for about eight bucks, and then you cut it into five foot lengths and drill a few holes um, but anyway so I've got hot coal hot here and then on my cell line so these are boundary fences and made feeder lines to carry my, to carry my power around the farms uh, the, the quarters and stuff there's the rockies right there so you can see how close we are uh, and then my internal fence is just one single hot wire like this so there's not a lot of money gone into fencing but very effective when you do an electric fence the two things that guides really fail on is get that cheap ass bloody energizer. If you buy an energizer and it's in a tin box, chuck it away because it corrodes, because it sweats. That's why True Test and Gallagher all put theirs in plastic because it doesn't sweat. Um, so get a decent sized energizer. If you think you want to do a quarter, get an energizer that does a half section. Um, because you'll always end up saying, geez, I can go here, here, here. And you don't have to have big paddocks. All our, our yielding paddocks were, were 50 acre cells on a <coughs> section of land. Um, but these here on the quarters, um, they're 50 acres as well with about um, 40 cow calf pairs going around in circles. So if that's two take homes right there, you get a big energizer and the ground rods. Don't use um, steel, use galvanized. Don't use just raw and mild steel because the, it'll corrode and then you lose your connection to grounding. <coughs> and if you get a, if you get a um, 1800 joule energizer, which is 18 joules, to put about six ground rods in and have them about the length of this table, have them all connected together and then back to the energizer. So on my permanent fence here, because I've got a ground wire here, and these are two positives, my energizer's back here. I've got ground rods right next to that, so there's six of those. And then in each corner of this section of land, I've got ground rods tapped into this wire here. So it gives me a bigger expanse in the winter time when the soil turns dry. So that's two take homes right there if you want to go this kind of method. Okay. So these are some of the blends we've mucked around with and it's always evolving this, these blends and you can see those in those books. So here's your swath grazing blend right here, um, which, which is pretty much stable now. We've, we've mucked around with that enough. And so all you need to add, you know, five pounds of this and then 30, 40 pounds of cereal. If you're using wheat or trimmed or something, or rye, you'll cut back to about 30, but if you're using oats, you'll use about 40 pounds per acre. And then here is something if you want really a lot of root mass in there, then you can go with the with the root master. And this here blend is for your silages. So
So you've got Italian ryegrass, hairy veg, hunter, forage turnip, and Winford forage rape. You see that in about 10 pounds an acre. Then if you're in high rainfall area, this works really well uh, for irrigation. And you'll take that silage, cut off as normal, turn this pivot on again and let it go. And I think I might bring my iPad up and I'll show you some pictures of that, but um, that's really good. And then if you're using summer grazing um, and you're doing cattle and crop rotations, so you'll see this lighter here in, um, in uh, early April, and then um, it'll be ready to go by mid-June to the end of June, weather permitting. Then you'll multiple graze that multiple times. Um, Ed, Ed and a few other guys are getting three grazings before the, before the season's up. These are a few, you've probably heard a few of these people like Gabe, um, they're good references. Um, this is a researcher up in Alberta, Christine. This is a girl out of Australia. Uh, you can look all these people up on YouTube. Nicole Masters out of New Zealand. If you want to really watch a neat little video out of, um, uh, out of the UK, A Farm for the Future, it's a little radical on the end, but it's really good information in the middle. She talks about her family farm and where, it, where it's, uh, where it was, where it, where it's going, and what she's done to improve the, the running of the farm. Okay, and then, uh, oh, yeah. If you want to go to New Zealand, we have a study trip every year. <laughs> we go down in um, in June, and we spend a whole week down there. We go around intensive grazing rotations. We look at um, breeding farms for foragers, and then we look at. Uh, how guys run their operations and it's one week and it's it's a really good trip but you could win it if, if PJ's good good <laughs> <laughs> if you kiss his ass enough you might win it <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so that's that and then here's my contact info and uh, we'll do some perennial stuff have you guys had enough we'll do some perennial um, stand in I won't touch it until that fall or in the winter 
because the foliage up top does not represent the root systems down below because this is a solar panel and your soil's here and this job here is to build this here, the root system, ready for its first winter or, or, or the next season's coming. And if we say, oh geez, we've got tons of foliage and graze that off, we've just cut that solar panel down and now this, this energy source here starts slowing down. And so, especially with legumes, it's trying to build up some from uh, energy to survive the winter. That's why alfalfa is get your winter kill so much, because there's no readiness ready for the winter above here with your solar panel. So always leave that new pasture stand for a year uh, and then graze in the winter because it'll pay off because they're building root systems and building survival mechanism under the soil. Um, I always like to have about 70% legumes. So if you guys heard of sandpoint, and size of milk bench, yep. So, so my basics are sandpoint, size of milk bench, and alfalfa. And we use Algonquin alfalfa. Have you heard of that, Tony? Algonquin was developed by Ag Canada about 30 years ago, <clears throat> and nobody breeds it anymore because it lasts forever. And these alfalfa companies don't want you to have alfalfa lasting forever. They want you to turn it over every three or four years. But Algonquin was uh, bred up here at Lethbridge and then also up at, uh, on the Alaskan border. So it's had a lot of diversity and done very, very well. So that's what I like to use um, for, uh, for my pasture stand. But uh, having at least 70% in there, you've got your high energy and then the grass is bringing up the fiber. Okay. okay, so this is at home. Um, so you can see here I've got, I've actually got trip growing here. But I've started my seed, bread, my pasture preparation like we talked about a couple of years beforehand. So I've just gone and put some trit in there, some spring trip, and I'm just grazing it all through the summer. Just got the cattle go, going in there and grazing. Um, and then uh, I'll do that for a year or two. And then it keeps the, fir vets, uh, the uh, seed bed firm, but you're getting all that rotting from the existing grasses that are in there plus the trip from every couple of years, uh, from the two years, it's riding in there too, plus the cattle manure all around the place. So that's when you start thinking about your seed bed preparation and what you're gonna do is a couple of years before, unless you've got a really slick, clean bed, then you can do one year of cover crops and then straight in. Um, see, most of the issues that I see around the place is uh, guys seeding too deep. That's why with Union, we, um, our perennials are dyed yellow and our annuals are dyed green. And that's thanks to Frank at Blue Sky Colony. He, his tractor jockey put his um, perennials two and a half inches deep and nothing came up. And I was shit for a week because nothing happened and he was calling me and, and it's not growing, it's not growing. I went out there and there was nothing there but once we got digging around, thank God that seed was coloured because it, I would be in shit creek and, and, uh, and painting back everything. But we found the dye two and a half inches down, the seedling had struck up, got that far, it was about that far from the top and just played out. So seeding depth is huge. Okay. This is not a seed bed. A lot of guys say, yep, yeah, that's a seed bed, I'm ready to go. You haven't got it very firm, but you've all got all these clods here that um, when you're going through your drill, they'll lift up and then fall back down or they'll flip over to the other side and, and they'll smother the seedlings out. So I think we've got a bit of, oh, that's sod seeding. I'm big on sod seeding. Uh, so I think the next picture is, there you go. But I'll go back to that one. Yep, no, yep. So this is um, oats, I've done it again. I've gone, this was an old Timothy Hayfield. I've direct seeded in there. And this is the same, same, uh, a uh, year in the in the uh, sometime through the summer, but it's only cost me seventy to seventy two dollars with the chem and my seeding costs, and then plus the seed. So um, seed, the seed cost, whatever that was, it's two bushels of oats. Okay. And this is conventional. This is some land that I rented. Um, so Heather and I, um, we only have two quarters of land, but we're renting about sixteen hundred acres. 
So um, we're, we've got to keep all our tenants happy, otherwise they can rent it out in a heartbeat. So we try to do the best thing we possibly can. This was an old canola field. It was ready to go. There's still a bit of trash. But one thing this, most guys look at this and say it's ready to go, but if you walked across that um, and your heel sinks in, it's not a seed bed, it's got to be firm. Your, your heel should just sink in there or bounce a tennis ball and then she's ready to seed because half the problem is when they come in with the machinery, those wheels sink down and you've, already, you've got it set at this depth out in the sod or wherever, in the corner where the trucks drive in and out. But as soon as you get into, um, into the middle of the field like this, that big equipment just starts sinking and then you know, you're at two, two and a half inches, which happened to Frank. So, yeah. so this is weed control. So this is really neat. Um, this has got two stories here. This is uh, more rented land. Here is Roundup and just seeded, and here is cultivated and seeded. So we had the dandelions just come in, and it's the same blend, it's just that he, he started cultivating along this fence line and this fence line before I could get there. And I said, well, we can do this by just direct seeding. But you can see with the minimum till, you don't have the weed burdens. And I've got legumes in here, so <coughs> with dandelions, I can't spray anything to control it. This is um, Roundup pasture at home. Um, so I hit this paddock up with glyphosate. Um, and I didn't, I was only using um, a quarter of a litre of glyphosate, okay? Because there's still enough grass in there. All I want to do is add legumes only. So I set this crop back and I sprayed it in the spring, not in the fall, because in the fall, everything's getting ready to shut down. So the plants are taking tons of nutrient down to put in the root system to survive the winter. So that's why glyphosate's good in the, in the uh, fall, because it's a, you'll get a way better kill. But if you're doing this kind of thing, you'll do it in the spring, because the plants are growing and it's not uh, as aggressive taking the chem down, but uh, if you give it a quarter of a litre, then you go and seed your legumes, and that's the end of the season. So you can see the Timothy here, and then the legumes in, you know, all amongst this. So that was, um, you know, that was a win-win. We still had the grasses. It only cost me $38 an acre because all I was doing is introducing legumes. So that's another way for uh, seed seed um, rejuvenation pasture, seed rejuvenation. But this is Bert Anderson, that's the Sandhills of Saskatchewan, um, just um, straight above Maple Creek, um, and really shit soil, and this is, you can see how bad this soil is, it's just sand all the way through here. So there's another example, this is crested wheat, and Bert, we didn't want to cultivate that, so we just um, direct seeded legumes in there, okay? And so this is 2011, we put brome and orchard grass, we got sand for, uh, size of milk vetch here, and sand foin as well, and I don't know if we put alfalfa in here, um, but that was just a one trick pony, you know, it was cheap. And can you go back? Yeah. So you can see why we did it, because look at all the room we have here. There's not a lot of competition. So if you've got a pasture like this, this is still valuable, you guys are like crested wheat, can you? Yeah, it's the Saskatch Saskatchewan's national flower. It's just, <laughs> uh, just, that's there. On the, because in the 30s and 40s, they put crested wheat everywhere. So when you sprayed on one of the back pictures there, that was just to control the wheat? Go back. Not to kill the looms or This here? Yeah. Yeah, no, it was to control the grass. Oh, the grass. And I see, see the lines here? That's the legumes in here. So all I did with this paddock was control the grass a little bit. I didn't want to kill it out. And then put legumes in there. And then the following picture is at the end of the year, the grass has kicked back into gear again. Mm. And so, but the legumes have had time to outcompete or compete with the grasses. Okay. Otherwise that grass in that thicker stand would have smothered the legumes out. And this other picture from birds you can see how we've got tons of room in here, bare, bare soil. So we didn't do anything with that. We just went in there and direct seeded. So yeah, horses for courses. So you can see how that's thickened up in here with, uh, 
with the legumes and, and the brome and, and there's some orchard grass in here, I know. So that was a fall seeding versus a spring season when you did that too? Yep, this was done in, this was, uh, <laughs> actually yeah, it was a frost seeding this. So that's another thing you can do too, seed in the frost. You know, you'll have to help us out with that. So um, we wait up there until the soil gets below five above Celsius. Four, so, less than 40 degrees for 10 days is what we do. Right, okay, yeah. there you go. Because we don't want it to germinate, we want to sit it in there and then she's ready to go in the spring, which exactly we did here. So it's a really good method of seeding, especially if you're grain guys and they pass you and put back. So could we do that now? Here in December? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I uh, we certified seed two years ago, that was probably December 5th. Seeded. Yeah, you can definitely. If you machine to scratch into the ground. Yeah, if you can get your drill on the ground. Yeah. And especially with this perennial grass seed, because like Graham's saying, you only need to get it in there just barely. Mm. Um, so you can you can definitely scratch it in in the winter. And actually it works the last couple of years, the way springs went, I have been recommending frost seeding to everybody because the springs have been everywhere but what we wanted them to be and first we think they're too dry and we don't want to do anything and then they're too wet and we can't do anything so put it in the winter and let it come up when it's ready to come up can you and seed it's the quiet part of the year for you guys too mm -hmm. yeah. can you seed the peas and everything in now uh, the annual i've never done anything with annuals actually i've been wondering about that i haven't seen that yet either but i'm curious, curious. yeah we need to crash test dummy in your ear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I seeded some peas really early and day one well, I seeded three different days. On the second day there was a, an odd weather thing. It got really cold. So the first day came up through fine, the middle day didn't, and the third day was fine. So there, you can do it too early. Right. It was they they called it. Uh, I forgot what they called it, but it was a it was a sudden death center. El <laughs> <laughs> Nino, it was El Nino, wasn't it? Like El Nino, global warming peas too early. Yeah, it was like March. When you do stuff like this with legumes. And you do a frost seeding or in the summer if you're doing rejuvenate, re, rejuvenation. Um, put about 70 pounds of, if you don't do any soil tests, put about 70 pounds of 1152 in with your legumes and that'll that'll kick away. And then once these start inocul uh, nodulating, then they'll start feeding the grasses, right? So if you don't do any soil test, just do um, about 70 pounds of 1152, you won't burn the seed, but the phos. You were totally saying earlier, moving in the soil. If you're putting it right there in with the seedling, the roots move. The fos won't, but the roots move. So they'll find it. Yeah. And that does work here. I mean, there's uh, just outside of Harlem, Jay Smith has done some of that with crested wheatgrass, where he hit it once with Roundup, which doesn't kill the crested wheatgrass, but sets it back long enough to get your, he was doing just straight size from milk fetch. Um, so it does work. Yep. Like, you, when you do this, um, just say, okay, this is the cord I want to do, but I'm just going to get a couple of bags and run down the fence line. It's just say you're doing it today. And just, okay, see how it goes. Don't bank the whole farm on it and do these few bags and go up and down. And then once she's empty, she's empty. And then keep an eye on it. But when you do do it, run a fence, electric fence line, so the cattle can't graze this side of the fence, but they can still graze you crest of wheat or whatever you're going over here but then once it's in your head and you're comfortable with it and it's the right seeding rate you want then you can go gangbusters and it's just an insurance package to get used to what you're doing and then go for it and I, I do have a custom seeding business I bought a drill up from Australia and so I've done thousands of acres of custom seeding in pastures so with that drill it's 15 years old and I've been, I've been sure, it's only 15 feet wide and I've, I've bet you I've done over 20,000 acres of pasture seeding with it. So. What kind of drill is that? Is it? It's an agri plow out of New South Wales. Yeah. It's a sod seeding drill. Uh, yeah, choose the right crop for what you want to do. Like, you know, if you're in the dairy business and you know, a high legume, um, high energy fibre food, so you've got 
you know, your mix of alfalfas and grasses, but this is about 80% our um, alfalfa stand. Um, it's pretty clean. This is the first year of this, and it's direct seeded straight into the sod with a few, um, I don't know where the hell the canola came from because it was an old Timothy hay stand. Um, but uh, pick the right crop for what you want to do. Actually, I, it was probably Union Forage polluted seed. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> we send all the crap down here, we leave the inside. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, yep, so we talked about this already. Um, early seeding. This is a Walsh, which is Maple Creek, is just over here. Uh, and that was seeded in early April. And this, this photo was taken in August um, in some really hot years. This is a James Hargraves place. Um, I forget how many acres we do down there, a couple of hundred acres a year. But um, it works for him, and that's what we were saying before. Figure out what works for you, and he seeds early April. Uh, it's a lot uh, like this climate here, it's just over the bench. So it's not that far away from here. A couple of hours even, not even a couple of hours to, to Maple Creek area. But anyway, so that's straight alfalfa and he feeds that to his calves in the feedlot. Okay. Um, oh, okay, this is really good. I'm not a believer of um, nurse crops. And the Department of Agriculture used to push nurse crops quite a lot. Um, and I'd never heard of nurse crops until I came to Canada and I thought, holy shit. So what you're doing, you've got a, you've got a $70 uh, grass legume stand here, both pitchers, um, and then you go and put two bushels, $12 of oats in with it. Why? Just to get a crop off, because you don't want to see, oh, I can't not, not make money. But this crop, this is Catalan's feedlot on really poor sandy soil and uh, dry land out of Strathmore. And this is WA Ranches, that crop that I showed you old Dick standing in. Um, um, and on my place is this ridge up the back here. And their agronomist told, said, yep, we're gonna put a nurse crop in. I said, no, but the agronomist won. This is May 18th in 2016. Both photographs were taken. The exact same blend, way better soil, better moisture, um, everything was a win-win with this. This was good moisture, piss poor soil, and no nurse crop. And, and so May 18th, 2016. So if you're going to invest in a perennial pasture stand, don't use a nurse crop. Give it as much opportunity as it can because the fertilizer you're putting in here is because an annual is an annual and it's got to go and it's got to breed and it's got to get set seed and reproduce itself, will suck that way quicker than a perennial who's got this long a life period, and you're gonna go and um, sacrifice this for two bales an acre of green feed, buy it in. It's cheaper than doing what this is. So that's a take home there is, is no nurse crops, fertility tests the same, good fertility here, good fertility there. We poured the fertility in here with just a little bit of fertility that didn't need it, but it sure took it away from the crop. Yeah, this is, this is my boot here. Go, you can see it make a little seed bed. So, seed shallow, keep her in shallow. This is just showing you, I kept that open. It's got a packer on behind it here, but you can still see the seed and fur sitting right in here. So that's going into a grass stand um, that was introduced. Actually, this picture is that um, picture we just looked at where the, I gave a quarter litre roundup and that the legumes in. This is the picture. Um, we control uh, because we've got legumes and grasses together. This can come off as silage. So we've got shepherd's burst, red root pigweed, and there's some dandelions in here too. Um, but that can come off as, as silage. It'll make great silage. But don't mow it and then leave windrows because those windrows get steamy and hot underneath and they bake you know, the sea beans and you'll have rows where you have nothing but weeds. This is, um, <coughs> this is my pasture stands for my yearlings. That's that picture up there. This crop here is only two years old, so it's the second year. Uh, and we were doing um, uh, 2.2 to 2.4 pounds a day on non-hormone heifers on uh, grass and cattle with this. This section is cut into um, 13 rotational grazing cells, um, 500 head of cattle, 
uh, each cell, and this is another thing when you're grazing pastures, I want to just talk about this. Um, my solar panel, when the cattle move out, there's that much um, foliage left on the plant. The more you leave it, the quicker it grows back. Um, each one of these cells with 500 head of cattle on only get grazed for about 21 days a year in the growing season because um, we're moving through really quick and there'll be 500 head for about 10 days. I'll graze it down like this and I'll move them on and move them on and keep them going around in rotations. But we're trying to get the, the leaf and the plant before it gets to seed. You can see this is getting late because the most valuable um, time for a grass or a legume, as you know, is before, um, before it flowers or bolts because all the nutrients are still in the leaf. We're here, there's a sand point coming there, starting to flower and the broom and the orchard grass. There's, I can't see any alfalfa, but there's, you know, that once they start putting into reproduction, the nutrient level of the, of the leaf and the, and the foliage, there's a sand point there, um, starts decreasing. That's it. So do you have any trouble with, you know, having 500 head on how many acres? Mm -hmm. Do you have trouble with compaction? No, okay, so if we get a rainfall, because I've got massive roots under there, and remember I said to, I got that much, I don't have that much, and so the roots are really, so if we have a rain event, um, which happened in 2015, we, in, in July, we had about, um, about eight or nine inches of rain in that month, so I opened up cells, extra cells, so the 500 had more just on that place. So the paddock, um, the section was cut up, into two laneway. It had a laneway like this with cells going off it and then another water down here so it had a water here and a water over there and it had laneways and then cells going off it like this and then a permanent fence there and then another water and then lane, laneway and cells. So they're on the west side of it so I let three cells open for that month just so they weren't bogging it up. You don't want that soil to go black or start look, looking puggy because that's when the um, dandelions will come through or your weeds, whatever weeds. So, so that's that. Um, go through this, so we talked about the high, high fiber, uh, low fiber, high protein, and, and the, so when it's like that, it's high in sugars in the plant. So that's when you get photosynthesis and then you get the high metabolism in the rumen. Uh, the less mature plants, um, we talked about that, um, the higher uh, nutrient. Intermediate plants, 90% of the cellulose may be digested, the, the rest will be passed out. Uh, Overgrazing we talked about, fresh water, everything we wear out of, um, we don't use dugouts, we're all um, tyres. And we always, there's one paddock out of every one of our scenarios with the cows and the yearlings that never gets grazed that year at all. It just stays, um, just stays natural. It, it builds up roots, it builds up foliage, puts a lot of um, seed heads on. So the following year, the yearlings or the cow calves, after the cows have calved in the native grass, I'll go to that high legume pasture. And because sand point and vetch will pass through the rumen without breaking down, they're either trampling it in into the soil or eating it and shitting it out the back end and then repopulating your, your farm. So in your whole system, when we were saying earlier, let the system work, that goes for the perennials too, is um, there's one paddock in your whole system that's gonna rest, it's not gonna do anything all that year, and you, it's gonna pay off tenfold. And every year you'll pick another cell or a paddock that will not get grazed until later in the fall or the following spring. Uh, grazing legumes, this is um, some rented land, that's straight alfalfa in there. So we've got yellow blossom, beaver lodge alfalfa, and then your normal Algonquin and stuff um, in here. That was 40 cow calf pairs on 40 acres for the whole summer, from uh, beginning of May till coming out in October. But I had a fence on their ass and in front of them like nothing else. Uh, they only got so much a day. I moved that fence every single day these calves came out the heaviest of all the calves that year. They're close to 690 weight cattle for May. But um, when the, at weaning time, normal weaning time in November, um, so they, they, they got sold actually, because they did so well. 
Um, but that fence here, I've got no problems grazing straight alfalfa at all. Um, but it's micromanagement. There's an electric fence right here, and there's an electric fence right there. Um, they're not allowed back onto the foliage that they've grazed because that's when alfalfa is most potent, you guys know. But it can be done really easy, and those cattle are absolutely shining. And uh, can I just ask you why daily moves and not say three daily moves? Because of the bloat issue. Yeah, so, so because this is getting late into flower, so this is its third, a uh, second time over. So this is getting towards October. I mean, uh, August. Um, his haystack is full up here, so so that's getting later in the season. But right now, all you need is 10% flower to cut the bloat risk down by 45%. So the more flower, it just keeps cutting away at that bloat risk. So this, you can see there's a lot of flower in here, but in the spring and early summer, that's when we've really got to micromanage it. But yeah, that's just for bloat. So that's why you <clears throat> you have uh, such an intensive fence program there? Yep. <clears throat> if I have a cow, <clears throat> look at alfalfa, she'll blow. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you let them one guys. do, let them blow. Let them go, and then uh, <laughs> don't blow, you keep on board. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, actually, you know, you know, Brahman don't blow, right? So, I forgot to mention, when I came to Canada, oh, there's another mini, um, half my herd is, is a quarter Brahman. I bought some Brahman soon enough with them. But there's none in here. Um, so, blow, blow, Brahman are, are non bloating panels because they actually burp, so, uh, and they burp, they can bring it up themselves. Um, but the, with Sandpoint and Vetch, I forgot to remember, uh, forgot to mention, Sandpoint and size of Milk Vetch are non-bloating legumes. So that's where you've got your grasses, your Sandpoint and Vetch, and then you've got your alfalfa, you've got no <coughs> risk of losing any cattle on that. So are there any producers here that raise Sandpoint? I know we can buy it. I tried. <laughs> really? Yeah, I was going to say that I, I have not recommended it. Sandpoint <clears throat> to anyone because it just doesn't perform very well with our heavier soils. Right. We've got down here, but Sizer Milk Fetch is really good. Perform well. There you go. Yeah, but sand, I wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't tell you to try Waste it. money. Unless yeah, well, there's some at many berries and foremost. Um, this side of the bench, you know where they are? You know where mm. many berries? No, I You know where the wild horse. Um, Customs is yeah. about two miles north of there. There's um, uh, Darcy. Uh, hmm. uh, anyway, he's got some growing there, but but it's have you got any? They're growing it all over around Lewistown now. Yeah, ground there used to be alfalfa. A lot of sandpoint down there now. I've had neighbors try it. They hate it off. It was uh, kind of slow regrowth, but uh, seemed like it was. Alfalfa did a lot better as far as the hand part of this. Sandpoint is <coughs> well, yeah. That's where uh, this new Glenview is just Dr. Syria with the Department of Agriculture, Canadian Department of Agriculture, and Lethbridge Research, Research Station. Um, this new Glenview Sandpoint has the same gro growing rate and the tonnage as what alfalfa is. He's taken, it's taken 15 years for him to get this up and going, so, and that's the one we have. So, we've talked about most of this. Talking about all those, all those. So there you go. Is there any questions? It's three o'clock.